From the heartland of America, the gateway to the West, this is Engineering Tomorrow, the podcast, keeping you entertained and in the know on the latest commercial and industrial heating, cooling, and water treatment technologies. Welcome to another episode of Engineering Tomorrow. I am your host, Brian Gomsky. We are in the lowlands of Chesterfield, Missouri again, and we do have some very special guests on the show today. Um, we have Kyle Knuton with McClure Engineering and Eric Eiler with Midwest Machinery. Um, everyone, please give them a round of applause. All right, great, great, great to have you guys. Kyle, take one minute and uh, introduce yourself and uh, what do you do? Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Kyle Knuton. I work at McClure Engineering here in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I've got a background in both consulting and as a uh, temperature control contractor prior to uh, joining McClure. And so I work on building HVAC systems and uh, specifically also commissioning of building HVAC systems. And Eric, it's been a while since you've been on. Um, what is it you do around here? Because I'm not entirely sure. Well, it, it's vague on times. But, um, so I'm an outside sales engineer for Midwest Machinery. Little known fact is uh, Eric has a physics degree and his uncle works for NASA. Um, that's in his email signature. Um, if you don't believe me, he works for NASA. <laughs> so, uh, Kyle... This show is uh, it's obviously called Engineering Tomorrow, and we actually have an engineer on the show. Um, Eric, you don't count, sorry. Um, <laughs> where does mechanical engineering fall within the construction community and within the construction industry? What What is your role? Yeah, so uh, mechanical engineers working in buildings, uh, they're, they're really kind of, I, I'll say, three primary systems that, that we affect that is hvac plumbing and fire protection okay and so for many uh, it, th those of us who work in cons at consulting firms where we're kind of traditionally generating the plans and specifications that contractors go out and execute um, we take sometimes a little bit more of a prescriptive approach to fire protection uh, that that will be frequently a delegated design system where um, folks who do more Intricate hydraulic calculations than we do uh, might might do some of the details. Not all. Some firms do those in house as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the plumbing systems we 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 reflect as well. Um, and a lot of our time gets spent primarily on the HVAC systems. So that's the sizing of the systems, the selections of the systems, and then drawing how those get executed and installed within a building. So where do you fit in in the process? Um... Let's say uh, Jeff Bezos wants to build his next headquarters out here in St. Louis, and they buy the they buy the land. I guess what they select an architect. How does um, tell me from the architect selection? How does that work down to when do you get involved in the project? Yeah, so the 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 relationships that exist in design are very similar to the relationships that exist in construction. So the architects work as the general contractor, and then all of the engineering disciplines beneath them kind of function as the subcontractors. So yes, very frequently an owner will have a request for proposals or a request for qualifications goes out. Um, sometimes that will be to the architectural firm only. Sometimes they'll request a partnership with an engineering firm. And so architects go out to engineers typically that they're familiar with working with um, that either they've got a good working relationship with or if that owner has an established relationship with the engineer, sometimes they'll leverage that in, into their mm -hmm. response. And so th then it's a, a process of submitting qualifications and, and bid numbers and then typically interview processes. And so very early on, that relationship gets established and then you proceed to define what is the project. Mm -hmm. So the like to your to your point, Jeff Bezos says, "I want a new uh, distribution center," uh -huh. and he, he knows that in concept. So the architect and engineers help put a point on what are the specific attributes of the building that we need to address, and what 
expectations would we have of it from a technical construction standpoint? Right, because if you don't like nail down on what those expectations are, he could say he wants an XYZ building, but you know, in his mindset, he's thinking you know he's getting a much you know different building. So you have to nail those down at that point. Otherwise, you know, people's expectations will are never never going to be hit. So if you put it on paper, you figure it out, you line it out exactly how you want to. At that point, is where you start to nail in those details. Correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And and the folks that are good at that are good at bridging the technical aspects of the construction industry with kind of maybe someone who's non-technical but who knows what their needs are and helping put a point to um, um, how, do I, how do I achieve those goals. What does the interview process look like when you are interviewing to essentially land the job? Like what questions are they asking you? So a lot of it's based on previous experiences or the, 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 the exhibits we provide are previous experiences, similar building types, similar building sizes. Sometimes it has to do with approach. So they might have an, an, an idea of what does their product delivery look like. So if they know and understand they're interested in a design build delivery system, they might ask questions of how you can support that and what your experience is with that. If they think they want to go design bid build, um, likewise, what are your capabilities? What are your history with that? So sometimes there, there's notions, particularly for clients who have some experience constructing buildings, they'll have a notion of what delivery system they, they prefer for one reason or the other, whether it be cost, time, um, or, or you know any other uh, consideration they have. Obviously, I know how long it, sometimes it can take us bidding to contractors. How long does it take for you guys to put a bid together? for a building so it, it it's kind of interesting so well, uh, a very conventional structure for a large building is based on percent of construction costs hmm. Be okay. because uh, a lot of those particulars aren't known yet sure it's a very uh, abstract or impetus concept of w what are we building here and so since you don't know the the parts and pieces yet uh, most of those fee structures are based on percent of construction. So as as the understanding of what's needed evolves, it it may grow or shrink accordingly accordingly with it. So fees scale to the ultimate delivery of the building. Typically, at a you know an engineering firm, who puts those bids together? So th uh, that probably varies by firm. Some firms have dedicated marketing groups mm -hmm. uh, whose whose purposes are to uh, establish and refine relationships with uh, owners and, and and architects. Owners is it can be defined multiple ways for, for us. It, uh, our clients that we work for could be uh, an end user, it could be an architect, uh, or it could be a contractor. Right, so. Marketing departments that develop those relationships and maintain them and, and, and start those responses. Um, and then others have different approaches. Like at, at my firm, we don't have a dedicated marketing department to that end. Mm -hmm. We have um, those of us as principals in the firm maintain those relationships and respond to those to those requests for a proposal. Um, I'm actually going to back up to college. And this question is for both of you. When you went to school for engineering, did you know that you wanted to get into HVAC? Because I think of like a kid who wants to be a mechanical engineer, wants to design robots and, and spaceships. Um, uh, how did, how, what was that like for both of you? At what point did you kind of get interested in, in this field? Because let's be honest, it's not quite as cool as building robots and spaceships, but <laughs> it is, it is, it isn't interesting and you do get to, you know, do things, but. How did, how did that process look like for you guys? Well, I got hired in the recession, so <laughs> somebody offered me a job. <laughs> that wasn't, there wasn't Taco Bell. You took it, right? <laughs> right, right, yeah. Well, so the big thing was is when you're going through school, like I thought I was going to work for like Honda, R&D, or Yamaha, somebody like that. And you start, you know, you're a senior and you start looking for jobs and you realize that there's like six of those in the United States and you know, people don't leave those. So like, oh, crap, what am I going to do now? <laughs> Um, so, you know, I had no intention of going into anything HVAC related and kind of just landed here and really actually enjoy it. It's the the whole helping people thing is pretty cool. There, there's much more to that, I think, than you would get if you just, you know, 
worked and designed robots, designing the same part on the same robot as it evolves throughout its you know life cycle, you know, especially within the HVAC industry, and you know, working with McClure on projects, uh, there's no two that are the same. There's some that are similar, but it's like you know, there it's it's every day is a different task. So I think that's what retained me after I got into something that I had you know no initial thought of going into originally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I have a very similar experience, right? Uh, you know, to, to your point, Brian, is, you know, one of the struggles we have when recruiting talent mm-hmm. is uh, every mechanical engineer w- wants to design fighter jets for Boeing, yep. right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, For those who don't know, Boeing is a very large facility in St. Louis. And, um, or robots or mm-hmm. so- something flashy of what people understand and you know when you think about building hvac you know one of the things we say is uh, when it's working right you don't notice it right right <laughs> no love right no love at all <laughs> um and and so i i was actually on a path where okay so i fell into the the race car right oh. I, I was involved with formula sa in school i loved it i thought it was great uh-huh. um, part of our competition every year is we went to compete in detroit Oh, wow. And so I I went to Detroit several times to visit, and um, I just kind of didn't feel that city in terms of a place where I wanted Mm -hmm. to be and live and wasn't really sure about the automotive market. Now, that was in the late 90s, so (laughs) it was was fortunate that I got uh, maybe uh, apprehensive of the U.S. automotive market before then. (laughs) Right. Um, But um, so I, I literally just... Hopped in my in my in my little Honda Civic one day and uh, drove around to local engineering firms looking for a, a summer internship opportunity. Wound up at a at a local consulting firm that uh, did HVAC consulting. Didn't really know what it was. Turned out I was interest, really interested in it and, and had fun. And you know, one of the things I advocate for at this point, trying to lure people away sure. from robots and fighter jets mm-hmm. and race cars, um, is to to maybe appeal to their sense of conservation to, you know, with okay. so much focus on energy efficiency these days, um, our buildings in the U S consume 60% of the energy we produce. I think it's 40% of the energy we produce. Oh, I thought it was, yeah, I thought and it was. then, and then buildings respond to a large part of that. Right. And, and so if you want to affect change of energy in the U S working in buildings is a great place to start. Yeah, I think that's been just a, a, a huge miss within our industry is that, you know, how much we actually affect everybody throughout the nation, you know, their lives every day. We affect their I mean, there's, you know, ASHRAE things that have come into place because of, I, I immediately think of like sick building syndrome. You know, right? if somebody hadn't have figured that out and figured out how to correct that, you know, I mean, Every day, people's lives are going to be being affected, and mm-hmm. we just always take it for granted because it's there and, and it's cool and we like it. But it's it, it's yep. not flashy. And I, re- I referenced Joe Rogan last week, but uh, so he had Elon Musk on um, famous episode. He got, got in a little <laughs> bit of trouble, but he, uh, he even mentioned in you know converting every building residential to solar that the biggest load and the biggest problem was air conditioner. So you got to solve that problem before you can, you know, even you know, move farther down the line. Right. So uh, yeah, and I didn't think of, I didn't think about it from that aspect. So that's uh, definitely a good recruitment tool. So if you're thinking about building jets and you're listening to the show, uh, move over to HVAC and, <laughs> and call uh, McClure Engineering. They also don't tell you that when you're thinking you're going to go build fighter jets or design fighter jets, that you're not going to design the whole fighter jet. You're going to design <laughs> the tire. Right. Like, like you do one part. <laughs> um, so, Kyle, specifically, tell me about your role at McClure and uh, has it? Uh, have you been in the same role the entire time, or has it evolved? Yeah, so um, it, it has evolved to some extent. So uh, I- anymore, I don't do as many traditional design projects. Uh, I do have some clients that I provide those services for, uh, but for the most part, uh, uh, where, where kind of my passions really lie is in building commissioning, which uh, you know, building commissioning is. You, 
in total, it's a quality control process okay. for design and construction. So, uh, you know, all the literature would say it, it, it begins at the start of design and extends all the way through the end of construction and project acceptance. Very frequently in our industry, we see it leveraged more on kind of only the construction side, maybe not as much during design as, 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 as it could be. Um, and in particular, then, we, we focus on quality control and functionality at the end of a project. So how do we get all these design subsystems to work in a synergy to meet the ultimate needs of, of the client. Mm -hmm. So that meeting from day one of the architect of here's the building I want and what I want it to do for me, it's helping put all these individual parts and pieces together to make that function really happen. And, and also to like deliver the intent of the original design. So often you see an, an engineer designs it a certain way, it gets installed and it was never operated from day one at the points of how it was originally designed at. Right. So that, that's where your quality control comes in. Hey, we said that it was going to operate at this point because of this reason. And if it doesn't, then you've just initially hurt your efficiency from the very start of it. Right, right. So do you go in once everything is installed? Is, where, where do you specifically fit into the project? Sure. So, so in, if, if we're talking about design phase activities, one of the things we'll do is be another advocate at the table for the owners, uh, to sometimes just be a, a check to say, here is your original requirements and here's where the design is evolving to mm -hmm. and are they still aligned? Right. Right? Because sometimes uh, you lose the forest for the trees in, in any job sure. process, right? And so sometimes it can just be a check of are, are we still working towards that end goal? In construction, then it's how is that design intent being delivered? And so we like to have an earlier involvement to see early on are things being installed the way they need to be installed both per design and per manufacturer's installations instructions, mm -hmm. right? Because manufacturer A may have slightly different requirements than manufacturer B. And when the design drawings go out, the engineers don't know that. And so there's a, a correction potentially to be made in the process. So we try to involve as early as possible to minimize the impact to the contractors on the team as well as ultimately the owner. And so we'll get in early through the installation of the systems we're checking, which in our world is HVAC systems. And uh, so as those start to be installed, we'll be out and present on the job site and uh, helping make sure things are going in in an, in an order that makes sense and in a fashion that complies with everybody's requirements. Mm -hmm. Well, and I've seen your group specifically too have kind of a unique approach where after you've spent time in the field working with certain products or seeing how things are installed, that how that then impacts that end user. And after you relay that back then to the design engineers, they can incorporate it into their design on the next one so that basically, you know, the, the user factor of it's easier once it's installed too. So it, it, it's things that, you know, on paper look like it's a great idea, but maybe in function in the field's not as great. And if that gets relayed back to the design engineer, then it's that much easier the next time for that than next end user. And I've seen that impact with you guys uh, be pretty awesome because it's like, you know, so much of our industry is, you know, first cost, first cost, first cost. But ultimately, who's the one who pays the price at the end of it is the end user. And if you can make their life easier you know, in the field, it has played a big role. And I think that's something that I feel like you guys uniquely do is not only do you help in the process and make sure everything's how it needs to be, you relay those, you know, findings back and then they get incorporated again. Yeah, thank you. And it's it, and really for our design side, it's a luxury, mm -hmm. right, to have the feedback, yep. to still be present in the room and to get the feedback. I think most every engineer would love to hear what went well and what went poorly. So, well, what went well, I want to do that a lot more. And what went poorly, I want to stop doing that. Yeah, yeah. How can we not do that again? <laughs> <laughs> Close feedback loops, right? This could be related to um, different engineers, but what percentage of customers really want that ultimate efficiency versus I just want the lowest cost, bare minimum standards on my project? That's a great question. I don't know if I have a, 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 a number per se, but I will no, no, say... No, you have to give us a, a story. <laughs> <laughs> Feeds the fire right now. 67.4. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, I think 
I, I will say a trend is we're seeing a trend of more and more owners being conscious of this. Well, that's good. Right. Do you, do you think that's the owners being conscious of it, or do you think it's code requiring the owners to be conscious of it, or both? You're, I, a nice thing from our perspective is when code requires oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it, right? Um, with some of the utility costs, I think it's just something that people are becoming more and more aware of as well. Right. right? So as uh, and now some of our utility costs are dropping right now here in, in, in our region. Right. But which um, I'm not sure how because we're already like one of the lowest. But, <laughs> 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 but yeah, in total cost of ownership. Right. As as um, in. in what we see frequently is owners that have that own and operate buildings for a long time mm-hmm. or have buildings that have a large portfolio of buildings they operate. They really understand the operating costs and they understand the cost of their people, their maintenance, their staff, and what effect that has in the life cycle cost, mm-hmm. uh, which, which can be, can have even more impact than the energy. And so um, looking for systems that won't require as much work, as much maintenance. They, they have a, a, put a value on that. We're in a position where we, uh, we value owners that have that perspective mm-hmm. and uh, really like to align ourselves uh, with owners like that. How do you, how can you guys keep up with all the changing technology? I mean, for every single widget in the system, you've got 10 manufacturers and every six months they're coming out with something new. Not even, you know, McClure, but, I mean, as an industry in general, I mean, how how are people keeping up with all this? Yeah, that, that, great question, right? So we have several resources available. For those of us that work repeatedly with owners or contractors, that feedback, so mm-hmm. kind of similar mm-hmm. to Eric mentioned of the feedback loop we have internally, that way there are obviously trade magazines, professional organizations uh, that, that makes some of these resources available. Um, but an area where we rely on very heavily and lean lean on quite a bit, as Eric can attest, is our local uh, product representatives. Mm-hmm. Um, just keeping abreast of what's out there. Like you said, who, who squeezed out a few more efficiency points or who came up with an interesting approach that saved on ins- installation or made installation more robust mm-hmm. um, or, 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 or made maintenance better. Um, one of the things we struggle with, too, is it's fine if we see in a national magazine a widget with a great new capability, uh-huh. but if we can't get it locally and we sure. can't have it supported locally, the value of that could be diminished. And so yeah. local support and representation is huge in this regard. And so uh, leaning on our, our local representation is certainly a, a front line of defense for us for that. I used to think, too, that McClure was not an early adopter. And I, my mindset has since changed on that because it's not necessarily that you guys aren't an early adopter. It's that you're not an early adopter to certain things. If it, you know, how does it impact your owner and what is that going to do? And is in concept, you know, is that a reliable piece? Then absolutely you'll adopt early. But if it's the, you know, the next latest and greatest and there's not a track record of something along that line, then that's where you guys seem like you push back a little bit and will you know, let's wait and see long term. Is this, you know, is this the next fad or is this something that's here? And, and, you know, is there a reason why we should actually put that in? And it's from a, you know, a manufacturer's representative standpoint, it's interesting because I know I can bring stuff to you guys and show it to you guys. And, you know, maybe it's not going to be something that you'll pick up on right then and there, but it's always there. You're, you know, it's an arrow, an arrow in your quiver. You're going to hold it for when you need it. And as things develop, you know, there's a, a comfort level and an understanding with it, you know, that comes. But it's like I still go back to, you know, the why. If it if it fixes a need for you guys and more specifically for your owners, it seems like you guys will adopt quickly. And that's where, they, like you said, you lean on us for that because I, I tend to think that when, I, you know, I walk into your office, it's not you guys' job to be an expert on every specific widget when it comes from, you know, brand A to brand B. You know, you know what the widget does and why it does it, but – the nuances from A to B, that's where it's our job, you know, to help educate. And, and you know, that's where we kind of fall in line with the engineers then. so Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a great way of putting the product is our, our mentality is these products and availabilities, they're arrows in a quiver, right? None of them are Thor's hammer. 
Right. <laughs> that yeah. Now this is what I will beat into every project. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it, it's 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 another tool in the case. So when I encounter a problem, what can, what is a fix, right? Or if I need a solution, what can I solve it with? And so you have that lineup, and and it's it it's in that toolbox, and it's ready to go. And you know, ooh, I I got in a hard spot, and I remember I heard about this that that can really help me in that hard spot. And one thing maybe we don't do a good job of is explaining how long you can get parts for this equipment. You know, I think we've all bought a piece of consumer electronics where it breaks in a year and you can't get a part for it. you got to buy something new. What are you guys looking for in terms of longevity and being able to replace parts on those things? You know, so, so we like to say that we align well with owners that have a, a mentality of owning a building for 100 years. Um, now, that's not every building out there, right? Mm-hmm. There, there's a, a huge spot of our market that are uh, smaller lifetime buildings that are turn and burn, and maybe that's not appropriate for them. Sure. But if we do have a client that does have that long-term mentality, it's about strength and longevity. Sure. It's, um, you know, I know welded steel pipe will stay in a building longer than most everything else in there. So mm-hmm. there must be a compelling reason for me to use something different. There might be compelling reasons to use something different because of timeline delivery, ease, downtime, uh, shutdowns required for tie-ins. Uh, it, all, it all factors in. There's a, there's a there's a room and a place for everything, uh, but it's prioritizing individual clients' needs and what they're looking for and what their goals are. Right. So if if they know they want to be skinny and lean on maintenance, um, they're willing to buy a little bit more for maybe a name brand ball valve sure. than an off brand ball valve, knowing that when they try to close it, it will close and not leak. Mm-hmm. Right. And multiply that by everything in their building. Uh, yeah. Kyle, walk me back. Let's say uh, a project, all the equipment's installed, and here comes Kyle with his clipboard in his hard hat, <laughs> and he's ready with all the little sales peons behind him sweating. <laughs> with, <laughs> hoping they're. So <laughs> what 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 exactly? Tell me what that day looks like. Are you walking through with uh, all sorts of different measurement tools and pointing things out? Tell me about that day. How does that work? Yeah, yeah. So um, right. So we've got a lot of base observation, and so you've, we've got we carry a lot of reference materials with us. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of the ni- newer technology has been fantastic for this, right? So um, uh, we're now with tablet PCs and cloud-based storage, and now nice. for not much weight and bulk, I've got every plan, every specification, every cut sheet, every IOM with me. Electrons are don't weigh much right Right. and so that's huge we're armed with information in the field on the go Mm -hmm. um whereas traditionally literally was the clipboard and then take it back and research and so a lot of it's just that observation of is it all in proper is it all in right and and beyond that then we do tend to spend quite a bit of our time in the temperature controls systems okay it is an area of complexity it's also an area of um it's kind of an abstract specification that that you get, right? You get some, you know, where we have a boiler or a chiller that says must be this size, make this temperature at this rate. Um, controls frequently have a more abstract concept of here's a paragraph that says what do I want it to do, right? And then there's a lot of interpretation from a programmer of how do I achieve that sometimes. And so we'll spend a lot of time interrogating the software in the system. To make sure that it complies, um, you know, sometimes just a small setting or a set point can can make a system look like it's falling on its face, and in reality, they just have maybe uncoordinated set points. Mm-hmm. And 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 diving deeper into that, and and you know, the, the controls technicians they're doing a good job. They're doing what they can, and they're working with the information they have, but they're also working to a deadline, right? sure, just like everyone. And so everybody kind of likes to throw them under the bus, but, you know, they're working potentially with limited information late in the game. And so uh, we try to help bridge that gap and, and provide that information. And, you know, my group, we just happen to be very literate in temperature control systems. 
that's where a lot of complexity comes okay. in buildings. At the end of a job, that's where a lot of people notice what they will call, quote, unquote, problems. Okay. And so jumping into those systems to help mitigate that has been a big strength for us. Because most of the time at that point, the chiller that's there, the boiler that's there, whatever's there, it's already been vetted. It's, right. it's not like it's right. the incorrect one. Right. <laughs> I mean, bar in mind something bad happened. But right. <laughs> so that, yeah, like that's where, I mean, it, the right thing is already there. It's just telling it how to work in the correct fashion then at that point in time is the big thing. And it's, you got a bunch of those all over the place then that you're trying to, you know, coordinate to work together and send them the right things and not have them fight. You've definitely seen that be the big ones. So the peons aren't sweating too much <laughs> at that point. Well, and, and you know, the, the, I guess the thought press and the mentality I have is every building is a custom built machine. Right, we're point. using standard parts and pieces, but this building is the first time they've ever been assembled together in this way. It's yeah. a one-off build, yeah, absolutely. Right, it's like rolling into an auto parts store and just picking things off the shelf and expecting to bolt it up and drive off in a car. Mm. You wouldn't expect to do that. What right. do we do in buildings for some reason? Why is that? <laughs> it's like, is I don't that? know. I've never <laughs> thought about it like that before. So it it deserves some attention and and, and some patience. And some time to, to make that happen and, and work together, especially now with what we see with energy goals and efficiency goals. Uh, w- with these goals come complexity, and there's just more complex demands out of our modern buildings than there used to be. Um, you know, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad, potentially. But uh, with that complexity, it just takes the attention to, to, to details to make everything work together. <laughs> Where do you see the industry in uh, 20 years? I think we still, you know, we're, we're still going to see demands for, for hot and cold. Um, yeah, I, people like to be comfortable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, uh, especially in the States, some of us might be uh, asked to make some adjustments to what those expectation levels are. Then we make more reasonable assumptions of, mm-hmm. uh, um, to not expect it to be 65 degrees on a, on a, you know, 110 s- degrees day. Or, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I, I'm seeing some interesting push in, into the world of microclimates, where rather than uh, rather than conditioning vast volumes of space, you condition smaller areas in and around people. Hmm. And I think a, a, a big one too is in our buildings as they do grow smarter and more interconnected. I think we're going to see systems that right now maybe are. That they are billed as being inoperable and interoperable and and can coordinate with one another. Uh, the reality is very frequently they do not. I think they will, and we'll see more interconnected systems. We'll see AI in buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, we're right on the brink of that now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're actually getting into that into that space ourselves at McClure, and um, so I think you're going to see smart. Buildings that are that are bots that are that are trying to react to buildings in a in a more meaningful way. Tell me more about uh, AI because that is a very trending topic right now in HVAC. Um, you look at all the trade publications, and that's always uh, I think it gets a lot of clicks. But um, tell me where that's going, and wh- what are you guys looking at, and paint a picture of you know what we're going to start to see. Sure. So I, I think. Currently, AI in buildings um, looks like and is manifested with building analytics packages, okay. which are, are, are packages that run independent of but in conjunction with building automation systems. Okay. So they uh, watch temperature control systems. They watch power metering within buildings, lighting control systems within buildings, and you write routines and rules and functions that 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 throw uh, alerts when things are either maybe working incorrectly or could be working more efficiently. Mm-hmm. And so I think we'll see more pervasive use of that in our industry in the next several years. And I don't think that'll even take twenty. I think that'll I think it'll be five, and we'll be seeing it fairly commonplace. So right right now we're essentially writing if thens else sequences. When, when do you think we'll start to see the machines start to make the decisions? Are you thinking in the next couple of years? Uh, 
It's very possible. It's very, I mean, the technology's there. Sure. Right. It's there again. That's bridging the gap of what does the brochure say that our <laughs> capabilities are and right. what are we doing? And, um, you know, I know in, in our area, it, it, here in the, the show me state, mm-hmm. we tend to be in general a little more reserved sure. and conservative about this. We can afford to because we have relatively low energy sure. costs. Out in other areas on the coast, this is happening, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we there was a uh, fantastic presentation by someone at one of our uh, local ASHRAE chapter events of a uh, this automated building in Europe that when people arrive at, at, at their building, they drive into a parking space, and when they get out, their phone alerts and tells them um, what cubicle they're working in that day. Oh, it wow. changes day to day. And they, they walk in, and and uh, the elevator opens and takes you to your floor, and you get out, and you sit there for that day. And, and it's uh, dynamically adjusted based on what your work activities are on your schedule that day. So if you've huh. got meetings scheduled, uh, you may not, and you're going to be in conference rooms all day, you may not get assigned a space, a space at all. Hmm. If, you, if you have, you know, desk-type work, you might be sent to a more isolated environment for work. So... I think that's right there, and I think we just see more of that. And um, I mean, certainly, will we see that in a K through twelve? Probably <laughs> no. not, right? <laughs> right, right. But, but um, you know, for some other uh, buildings, I, I I I think that's there and on the way. Tell me about microclimates. You piqued my interest there. What can you give me a little more detail about that? Sure. So some of the things I've seen are um, things literally built into maybe desks or casework. Oh, wow that has small, smaller jets of air that would condition you at your workspace. Huh. We've seen that it, to some extent with raised floor systems to date, right? You mm-hmm. know, we've seen the argument of, well, you pressurize the plenum, and then rather than conditioning from overhead, you can have a floor register right under or near an individual that would condition them more locally. Um, and I think you'll see potentially a, a push towards some of that. Right, so instead of conditioning a, a twelve by twelve box that they're sitting in, you're going to condition the, the the four by four box right at their you know feet. Essentially. Right, right. I've even seen some crazy research out of Ashray of uh, clothing and even potentially active active clothing, <laughs> active cooling and clothing. That that seems a little farther out. There's spaceman suits that might be a little bit farther down the road for us all, but uh, I probably won't see it. <laughs> so, um, Kyle. Tell me, uh, you know, you've give us you given us a wealth of information today. Um, I want to give you a shameless plug. <laughs> tell, me, uh, tell me about McClure a little bit. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, McClure Engineering, we were established in 1953 right here in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we are a single office. Uh, we have two remote employees, uh, but not remote offices. Um, and we, we serve the uh, kind of... Uh, um, Eastern Missouri and Southern Illinois area. Okay. Um, building MEP services, commissioning services. We do have a uh, acoustic division, so we do uh, theatrical uh, projects as well as things like vibration, uh, vibration problems, whether that be something like uh, cooling tower analysis or uh, setting an electron microscope so that you can uh, shoot an image without excessive vibration down the table. Oh, wow. So who is the ideal client to pick up the phone and uh, and call you? Emphasis on energy efficiency. Okay. We've been doing energy efficiency since the uh, the 60s, long before it was in, in, in vogue. Um, and if you care about uh, longevity of your facilities and, um, um, again, uh, kind of a mentality of caring about the maintenance, keeping maintenance down, having robust facilities, and having efficient facilities, we uh, we sit well in that spot, and and we really like difficult projects as well, right? So if you have a a chiller or an air handler somewhere in the belly of your hospital, mm-hmm. and you have no idea how you're going to change it with without downtime, uh, we love those problems. That's <laughs> Things good. Of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. I would I would kind of add too. I mean, you guys are. You're very humble in how you describe, you know, McClure because I feel like you are a you appear as a much bigger company, you know, than just a single office with two remote people because you you have so many employees under under the umbrella and within those employees, you know, different groups and divisions. I mean, 
how, I don't even know how many mechanicals you guys have because I, you know, I, I it's, you're just all one big family. But I mean, the different, you know, I don't want to say disciplines, but you know, things that you guys, you know, hone in on, you know, the different groups that you have is is very extensive. And so, you know, just the the energy efficient guys, yeah, it's it's the the higher ed, the the you know, hospitals, you know, the plants. I mean, it's yeah. it's a, it, a very broad spectrum. So I mean the the humility there it was it was it was great but you guys do a lot <laughs> yeah it, it it you know a lot of them are you know it, it it's when you're f founded in physics which we'd like to think we are a mm -hmm. lot of these problems look the same so we'll call we'll refer to projects as a critical environment that could be a, a an auditorium that could be an operating room that could be a, a a museum or a cultural facility they had really the physics of that aren't aren't that different and so uh, if you kind of stay close to that and, and know how to apply it, it can go to, to different areas. So but thank you if you asked. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I've had a great time today. Um, I want to thank you again for coming out. Um, I don't know. You called me a peon earlier. <laughs> <laughs> that was the term of endearment. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> That's the nicest thing he's called you all week. It is. Absolutely. Um, I think we've officially had our most robust uh, and longest podcast to date, and uh, I'm excited about that. I think we talked about a lot of great things today. Um, so again, thank you guys for tuning in, um, and keep engineering for tomorrow today. You've been listening to Engineering Tomorrow, the podcast. For more insights and downloadable content, please visit our website at www.engineeringtomorrow.blog. Until next time, engineer for tomorrow today.